Good afternoon. We will now begin the webinar. Today is October 1st, 2021, and the time is 1.01 p.m. This webinar is being livecasted and recorded and will be available publicly on the MTA YouTube channel and the Central Business District Tolling Program Project website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. Today's webinar will begin with opening remarks followed by a presentation on the Central Business District Tolling Program and then public comments. Only those who signed up to speak in advance will be able to give public comments. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. If you did not sign up to speak at today's webinar, you may sign up to speak at an upcoming webinar. To do so, please visit new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's webinar. We will now start with opening remarks from Dr. Allison Desireno, MTA's Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. We're very excited to be engaging in public outreach for this historic project. And we thank you for taking the time to learn more and share with us your thoughts and comments. Joining me today are colleagues from New York State Department of Transportation and New York City Department of Transportation, as well as from the Federal Highway Administration, the lead federal agency for this project. We also have several individuals from our respective staffs here with us to listen to what you have to say. Your comments will be indexed and considered as part of the environmental assessment process. With that, let's jump right in as there is a lot to cover. Our agenda for today is to review the proposed program, the project purpose and need, discuss the project alternatives, provide an overview of the environmental assessment, and discuss and describe environmental justice considerations. We'll take a few moments to talk about the potential project effects and benefits, and then have a public comment session. So how did we get here? There's been a decade of congestion. Congestion in New York City has consistently ranked among the worst in the United States. Local bus speeds in Manhattan are on average 7% slower than citywide speeds. Between 2010 and 2018, travel speeds decreased by 23% in Manhattan's Central Business District, or CBD. And during that same period, multiple studies and panels explored how best to address congestion including the 2008 New York City Traffic Congestion Mitigation Commission and the 2018 Fixed New York City Advisory Panel. Many of them came back with the same concept of congestion pricing. There is also a need for sustainable funding source for transit. Prior to the pandemic, nearly 75% of trips into the Manhattan Central Business District were made using transit. 95% of trips to the Manhattan Central Business District by low-income populations are made using transit. MTA's subway system is over 100 years old and must be repaired and modernized to meet the region's needs. And funding transit modernization would improve service and attract commuters back to the system, further reducing congestion. In April 2019, the New York State Legislature passed the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. If approved by the Federal Highway Administration, this act would entail vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District be told. Net revenues would be used for public transportation capital projects, with 80% devoted to New York City Transit, 10% to the Long Island Railroad, and 10% to Metro North. The toll rates will be determined by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or TBTA Board, informed by recommendations of the Traffic Mobility Review Board and after a public hearing. There are mandatory post-implementation reporting and evaluation requirements. Make sure everyone understands the area about which we're speaking. Central Business District Tolling Program Boundary is south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Tolls would not apply to vehicles that are solely using the FDR Drive, Route 9A West Side Highway, including connections to the UL Carry Tunnel, or the Battery Park underpass connecting the FDR Drive and Route 9A. Federal mm -hmm. Highway Administration will serve as the federal lead agency for environmental review. They are responsible for reviewing all of our analyses to confirm that they are complete and they will also issue the environmental findings for the project. 
Metropolitan Transportation Authority and its affiliate, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority. The New York State Department of Transportation and the New York City Department of Transportation are serving as project sponsors. With respect to the project purpose and need, the project purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District in a manner that will generate revenue for future transportation improvements pursuant to acceptance into the FHWA's Value Pricing Pilot Program, or VPPP. The project would address the following needs. Reduce vehicle congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District and create a new local recurring funding source for MTA's capital projects. The following objectives further refine the project purpose. It would reduce daily vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, within the Manhattan Central Business District, reduce the number of vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District each day, create a funding source for capital improvements, and generate sufficient annual net revenue to fund $15 billion for capital projects for the MTA Capital Program, and establish a tolling program consistent with the purposes underlying the New York State legislation entitled the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. So how is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the project linked? NEPA requires federal agencies to assess and consider the environmental effects of their proposed actions prior to making a decision. The project would be implemented through the Federal Highway Administration's VPPP. As a federal program, that VPPP, or Value Pricing Pilot Program, is subject to NEPA. Federal Highway administration is the lead agency and has determined that an environmental assessment with extensive outreach is the appropriate level of environmental documentation for this project. There are two project alternatives. There's the no action. There would be no central business district tolling program, no comprehensive plan to reduce congestion in the central business district, and no identified transit capital revenue stream. And there is the build or act alternative, where we would build a central business district tolling program. There would be new tolling infrastructure and toll system equipment, implementation of a tolling program, which would have multiple scenarios in the environmental assessment to assess and identify the range of effects, positive or negative. And there would be creation of a new revenue stream for investment in subways, buses, and rail. A little more detail on the proposed central business district tolling program alternative. As noted earlier, tolls would be charged for vehicles entering Manhattan south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Passenger vehicles would be charged once per day, and there are exemptions required by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act for qualifying vehicles transporting persons with disabilities, qualifying authorized emergency vehicles. Central business district residents with gross adjusted incomes below 60,000 would be eligible for a tax credit. And there would be a Traffic Mobility Review Board that would be tasked with recommending to the TBTA board the toll structure, including but not limited to a plan for credits, discounts, and or exemptions. Recommendations will be informed by a traffic study and must take into account multiple criteria, including the ability to generate revenue required, the impact on traffic patterns and volumes, public safety, air quality, among others. With respect to the toll, the environmental assessment is going to assess a range of scenarios and will be informed by robust public outreach. Studying multiple scenarios ensures that we understand the full range of potential environmental effects, including but not limited to congestion reduction that different toll rates may cause. Toll rates will differ in each scenario depending upon the time of day, how someone pays, and the inclusion and extent of any credits, discounts, and or exemptions beyond the two mandated by the enabling state legislation. Importantly, all else being equal, the more credits, discounts, and or exemptions that are given, the higher the toll must be in order to meet the project's purpose, needs, and objectives. The modeling is not complete and a final determination of the toll rates will not be made in the environmental assessment. Indeed, the toll rates, as noted previously, will ultimately be set by a vote of the TBTA board after the environmental review process and after the Traffic Mobility Review Board makes its recommendations. So importantly, these numbers I am about to share are for informational purposes and subject to change. With that said, to give you at least a sense of the range of potential toll rates, we anticipate that the easy pass peak period toll for automobiles will range from roughly $9 on the lower end to $23 on the higher end if many credits, exemptions, and or discounts are provided. The range of potential toll rates for automobiles using tolls by mail would be higher, roughly $14 to $35 for the peak period, again, depending upon scenario. Off-peak and overnight toll ranges may be lower, and tolls for trucks and other vehicle types would have different ranges. With respect to the study areas, 
The broad study area for the environmental assessment includes a region of 28 counties throughout New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. There will also be more refined local study areas, including the Central Business District, as defined by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, in other words, 60th Street and Inclusive and South, with those other areas excluded, as we described earlier, and neighborhoods near the Central Business District boundary where the project could have social, economic, or environmental effects. In terms of the key topics of the environmental assessment, this is not the full list, but we wanted to at least give you some sense of the kinds of things we'll be studying. Among them, as you can see, regional transportation, which is obvious, will be looking at highways and local intersections, commuter rail, subways, and buses, parking and pedestrian and bicyclists. We'll also be looking at social and economic considerations and conditions. We'll be looking at the visual resources, air quality, noise, and environmental justice, among others. Environmental justice is an important consideration for the project. Given that over 51% of the population within our study area lives in environmental justice communities, we're going to spend some time walking you through the federal requirements to address environmental justice and some of the tools we'll be using to engage with environmental justice communities. The term environmental justice refers collectively to minority and low-income populations within a project study area. In 1994, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12898 which requires federal agencies to consider the effects of their actions on environmental justice communities. In subsequent years, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration have issued their own orders on environmental justice. Our environmental assessment must comply with all of these orders. The orders provide that Federal Highway Administration take the appropriate and necessary steps to identify and address disproportionately high and adverse effects of federal projects on the health or environment of minority and low-income populations to the greatest extent practicable and permitted by law. This slide shows the steps we'll be using in developing our environmental justice analysis. It is based on guidance developed by Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. As you can see, we begin by identifying minority and low income or environmental justice populations and environmental justice communities. We engage within outreach with those communities, as you can see by the little picture on the right. We then determine whether the project would result in adverse effects on environmental justice populations or communities. We consider mitigations for those adverse effects of the project, as well as potentially offsetting benefits to the affected environmental justice populations. Again, there is outreach and engagement during that process. If the effects remain adverse after mitigation, we identify disproportionately high and adverse effects. If there are no disproportionately high and adverse effects, the evaluation is complete. If there are disproportionately high and adverse effects, we evaluate further mitigations or alternatives to avoid or reduce those effects. The Federal Highway Administration Environmental Justice Order provides specific definitions for minority and low income populations. As you can see here, minority is defined by U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration as a person who identifies as Black, Hispanic, or Latino, Asian or Asian American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, or individuals identified as some other race by the U.S. Census. Low income is defined by United States Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration as a person whose household income is at or below the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines. For a family of four, the 2018 U.S. Census Bureau poverty threshold was $25,750 for the study area. Based on the definitions in the previous slide, we have identified the environmental justice populations in our 28 county study area. As noted earlier, and as you can see in this table, over 51% of our study area population is considered minority and over 13% is considered low income. This map shows the distribution of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. The map shows large concentrations of environmental justice populations in New York City and the immediately surrounding suburbs. There are also large concentrations of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. Our public outreach will engage with these communities as much as possible. One way we'll be engaging with the communities is through the creation of an environmental justice technical advisory group. This is a group of technical experts who have knowledge of environmental justice considerations and can share concerns drawn from throughout the study area. The group is comprised of community leaders, advocacy group representatives, and industry group representatives with specific interest in environmental justice considerations. 
Their purpose will be to identify concerns and mitigation if needed and help to ensure information is circulated as widely as possible to the larger communities. The technical advisory group will be by invitation only, and we anticipate the first meeting convening in early October of 2021. Potential participants will be contacted in advance. We will also be creating an environmental justice stakeholder working group. This is a group of interested members of the communities throughout the study area who would also like to participate beyond submitting comments or participating in the webinars. This group will be comprised of interested members of the community, and the purpose is to share concerns and request discussion on particular issues as appropriate. To suggest yourself or someone else, you may visit our website, or you may com to complete a form, or you can contact us by phone at 646-252-7440. We anticipate that the first meeting of this group will be convened in early November of 2021. And again, once we have all the names and contact information, participants will be contacted in advance. We're going to review some of the potential effects of the project. Importantly, these effects are dependent upon scenario. The next slide will highlight some of the potential benefits, but I'll take a few moments to talk through the bullets here. We anticipate that there may be effects where there would be new tolling infrastructure and equipment, that there might be changes in traffic in neighborhoods near the Manhattan Central Business District, and that there might be traffic that diverts around the Manhattan Central Business District to avoid tolls. Again, dependent upon scenario. Near the Queens Midtown Tunnel and the Hugh L. Carey Tunnel, we anticipate some traffic diversions on the highway system that could result in more than a nominal increase in traffic. Preliminary analysis suggests this change in traffic would not occur on local roadways and would not adversely impact air quality or noise in the neighborhoods where the highways are located. However, we will be looking more closely at the neighborhoods adjacent to both sides of these tunnels. Some drivers currently travel through Manhattan, although their destination is elsewhere. For example, you may travel from New Jersey to Brooklyn or the Bronx by going through Manhattan. Preliminary modeling indicates that some of these drivers may change their routes and traffic may increase in certain locations depending upon scenario. We will be looking more closely at the extent of those increases in parts of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx, and whether they could result in notable changes in traffic, air quality, or noise. Preliminary analysis also indicates that new transit passengers who may take transit rather than drive will be spread throughout the transit system and will not overcrowd any particular route or line. Based on preliminary analysis, the shift to transit would not notably change access to transit, transit services, or pedestrian circulation near transit stations and hubs. In terms of tolls on low-income and minority populations coming to the Central Business District from throughout the region, a direct effect of the project on residents of the Manhattan Central Business District who are part of an environmental justice population is that they will be charged a toll to drive into the Central Business District. However, the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act provides a tax credit for those individuals whose primary residence is within the Central Business District and whose New York adjusted gross income is less than 60,000 per year. Preliminary analysis has found that fewer than 1% of the Manhattan Central Business District's commuters are low-income individuals who drive but nonetheless, we are assessing the economic effects of the additional costs for these customers. Tolls on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry, which has a high proportion of workers who identify as minority, as defined by United States Department of Transportation guidance, are also being looked at. Industry data shows that a high percentage of taxi or for hire vehicle drivers identify as belonging to a minority population. Once there is a new toll for entering the Manhattan Central Business District, some passengers may no longer choose to use taxis and for hire vehicles. We will examine the effect of the project on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry and the resultant effect on minority drivers. With respect to potential project benefits, if approved, we anticipate the project would reduce vehicular traffic in and near the Manhattan Central Business District. Overall, and depending upon scenario, our models predict a 15 to 20 percent reduction in traffic volumes that would enter the Manhattan Central Business District each day. As a result, we would see improvements in air quality and traffic noise as there would be fewer vehicles. We also anticipate improvements in travel times within the Manhattan Central Business District, again, as there would be less congestion. And of course, the project would provide additional funds for subways, trains, and buses, funding the MTA capital program, which includes many projects to improve and expand subway, bus, and commuter rail service. This would benefit MTA's transit commuters, including environmental justice populations. I wanna take just a moment to discuss or describe the anticipated NEPA schedule. We've already begun our outreach. That's what we're doing here today. And we anticipate that this outreach will continue through January of 2022, as we also prepare the NEPA environmental assessment. 
between February 2022 and May 22, 2022, there will be review with Federal Highway Administration of the document itself. And at the end of that period, the environmental assessment will be made available for public comment. Once the document is made available for public comment, there will be a public review period and a new comment period. That period will also include additional outreach related to toll rate ranges. Between that June 2022 date and December 2022, the work will be done to incorporate all of that information to make sure that the final outreach is done and ultimately to have Federal Highway Administration make an environmental determination. If approved by Federal Highway Administration, future outreach and public hearings will be held as part of the implementation and traffic mobility review board process during 2023. Here is the list of all the public outreach webinars we are holding. As had been noted in the distribution materials prior, you may attend any one of these or all of these as you would like. We also have the three environmental justice outreach meetings, webinars. Those will be occurring on October 7th, 12th, and 13th with slightly different focus areas. But again, as with the public outreach meetings, residents may attend any one of the webinars they would like to. In terms of our stakeholder working group meetings, we expect the first one in early November, the second one in late November, and then we expect a third one in June of 2022 once the environmental assessment has been released for public review. Thank you. We will now move to the public comment portion of today's webinar. We encourage anyone joining via Zoom or live stream to take a short survey using the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. We're gathering public comments today to inform the environmental review process. Comments will be reflected in the environmental assessment once it is made public. Rather than responding to comments as they are given, we will do our best to address specific questions whenever possible in the Q&A chat function. However, please understand that at this phase of the process, your question may be one that cannot be answered meaningfully until completion of the modeling and analysis. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Please note that each speaker is limited to two minutes. We ask that speakers keep their remarks to the two minute timeframe out of respect for all other speakers. We will, be, we will be calling speakers who live in the geographic area that is the focus of today's webinar first in the order they signed up but everyone who signed up will be called to speak today. If you've joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. When you're called on to speak, there will be a brief transition on your screen. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before beginning your remarks. You will not be able to unmute or enable your camera until it's your turn to speak. Please remain patient until then. In the event you miss your name being called, we will call the list one more time after all speakers in attendance have been called a first time. As a reminder, this webinar is being livecasted and recorded and will be available publicly on our YouTube channel and our project website. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. We will now begin the public comment portion of today's webinar. Our first speaker is Alan Blaistein, followed by Johnny King. Alan Blaistein. Our next speaker will be Johnny King. Johnny? Hello there. We can hear you. 
Okay, great. Can you see me? <laughs> yes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, as you said, my name is Johnny King. I live in New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm a motorcyclist who commutes to New York City for work. I work in all of the five boroughs because I'm a film television grip, and we do many locations. Um, you'd be correct if you assumed right now that, by my opener that I'm speaking today on behalf of all motorcyclists who will be affected to employ you to make motorcyclists exempt from the congestion tolling that is forthcoming. I own a car, uh, but for the sake of saving gas and easy parking and cutting down on my commute time, I opt to ride my motorcycle. Actually, now in light of the, the tolling that will take place, um, I'd be even more incentivized to ride my motorcycle provide, provided that motorcyclists are indeed exempt, which I hope that you guys will make us exempt. Um, I hope that, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this CBD TP to allow us to, to give these comments because I think that this is a monumental uh, happening that is going to affect so much in the future. I hope that you guys consider that going forward without exempting motorcyclists, that you'd be setting a new precedent that would penalize or at least not reward motorcyclists who, pro who have proven around the globe that congestion and carbon footprinting is definitely mitigated by riding two wheels. And now with late model motorcycles that um, have catalytic converters, the old idea that uh, motorcycles are, don't really actually um, help with mitigating carbon footprinting is not true. I hope that you guys will definitely take in con consideration that we should be exempt from paying a toll while reducing uh, congestion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dice O, followed by Jackie Cohen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, I'm Dice. I live in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, as a resident of Connecticut who frequently travels to New York City, I'd like to comment strongly in favor of congestion pricing. The driving community needs to take more responsibility for the many negative externalities that their behavior causes on the rest of society, such as air pollution and pedestrian deaths. There is no God-given right to drive and park a motor vehicle for free into the densest and most transit-rich city in the United States. We are in a climate crisis, and it's imperative that we do everything to discourage unnecessary driving and encourage public transit use. Congestion pricing is one important policy tool that should be used to raise the cost of driving and use the revenue to fund alternatives. Please ignore the naysayers who claim that it's somehow unjust to raise the cost of driving. Drivers are overwhelmingly wealthy compared to the vast majority of the working class who take the bus or train into New York City, who suffer from slow buses stuck in car traffic, from asthma caused by car tailpipe emissions, and who are killed and injured by reckless drivers. There should be zero exemptions for special interests or income groups. Congestion pricing will fail if there are too many carve outs. Everyone needs to pay their fair share for driving. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jackie Cohen, followed by Alan Blazenstein. Hi, uh, my name is Jackie Cohen. Good afternoon. I'm the Director of Climate and Equity Policy at Tri-State Transportation Campaign, an advocacy and policy organization fighting for sustainable mobility in Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. We are in a climate emergency and our region is faced with the challenge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 85% and reaching 100% net zero carbon emission economy by 2050. Since the devastating impact of Superstorm Sandy in 2012, we have been at the front line of the climate crisis that continues to threaten the region. Torrential downpours and flash flooding from, some stor from storms in recent weeks are expected to occur more frequently and become even more severe. We must act now to, to reduce carbon emissions from the transportation sector. Not only does congestion pricing protect our environment and public health by reducing the number of cars driving into Manhattan, it's also a win for millions of transit riders, including thousands of Metro North commuters coming from Connecticut, who rely on regional transit that is in desperate need of new revenue to fund its multi-billion dollar capital program. We at Tri-State Transportation Campaign have been fighting for congestion pricing for well over a decade, and now it's finally within reach. We cannot wait. Uh, we cannot afford to delay any longer. Thank you. 
Thank you. The next speaker is Alan Lazenstein, followed by Deanna Douglas. Alan? Alan, if you're able to unmute yourself, you'll be able to begin your remarks. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so, sorry, I was having trouble with, with my uh, uh, Zoom. Hi, um, I live in West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, I'll try to speak briefly. Um, I would like, I support this program for multiple reasons. Uh, one of which from a Connecticut resident standpoint, I visit my son in Queens frequently. Uh, I love taking, my wife and I love taking rail, but, uh, Metro North is very, very slow. We know that the infrastructure has been totally neglected over the years. Um, I, saw this, I see this as one of many possible sources of funds to make those improvements. Um, I also, of course, support the, what other uh, people were saying about the environmental benefits. Uh, my son is, a, is an avid cyclist and, and he is also a pedestrian, obviously, and, and user of transit. And uh, getting more vehicles off the road is a good way to improve safety uh, for cyclists and also to encourage people to take transit. I also support it for the environmental reasons that were mentioned. Um, I think this is one of many things that can be done to reduce greenhouse gas consumption uh, emissions. And I, in fact, I hope that uh, 15 to 20 percent seems like a very low, I would like to see 50% of, of the vehicular traffic in, in Manhattan reduced. And uh, in turn, we could, it would make the people, the essential services, you know, the, the, the taxis, the, the emergency vehicles, the buses, et cetera, would also have an easier time of getting around. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Deanna Douglas and David Starman. If you are signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function. The next speaker is Deanna Douglas. Deanna? Hello. We can hear you. Hello. Um, I would like to say that I'm actually a resident of the Central Bissick District, and um, I couldn't join the other meeting for residents, but I would like to say that I'm very against congestion pricing. Um, it would add to the cost of living, and I would also say, you know, a nice compromise, because I know that the MTA needs more money would be to at least give exemptions to people who live in the zone. Um, people who live in Staten Island, who live in Far Rockaway, get a discount on the tolls. Um, in addition, the exemption is not based on income. What um, the program is offering is only people who make um, 60,000 or below, which I'm totally against because it's hard to live in this area and make only that income. And a few alternatives would be instead of um, having the um, toll based on the area, why not just toll um, every bridge that connects to Manhattan, um, bring back the commuter tax, um, and find, just find other ways so it doesn't add to um, cost of goods to small businesses who rely on bringing their goods into the area because they will pass down what they have to pay in tolls to customers. Thank you. Our next two speakers are David Starman and Alexander Moreno. If you're signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function.
The next speaker is Alexander, I'm sorry, David Starman. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Starman and I part of a family business that is in New York. We serve the New York restaurant industry and we have since 1925, we're located in Brooklyn. We own a fleet of nine vehicles. That's over 500 accounts in the area targeted for congestion pricing or our accounts. And it's to me,